um, welcome to today's session of Surgery Online. We are really happy to have you all here. Today we will uh, talk about uh, tympanoplasty uh, surgery, uh, exec uh, or especially we will see two different surgeries done by two different surgeons using two different uh, prostheses. So this will be really interesting and I'm sure that you can learn a lot um, about why they chose the, the, this very prosthesis and how, how they did the surgery. So I'm really happy that Professor um, Dirk Beutner uh, from the University Klinik of Göttingen and Professor Robert Nunski from the University Klinik of Rostock um, joined, uh, are joining us today. Um, we will start with uh, Professor Dirk Beutner, but before we really start with uh, the interesting part, let's go through um, some small um, participant tips, namely, uh, one second, sorry. Okay, there we are. Um, we would ask you to rename yourself, so in case you haven't done that um, during the registration process, so please um, click on, uh, on your name in the part participant panel, um, and then on more and rename, and please type in your uh, full name. Um, to avoid, avoid background noise, we would ask you to uh, turn off all your microphones so that we can really listen uh, to, to um, Professor Beutner and Professor Mlinski what they say. Uh, for a stable internet connection, we also recommend to turn off all other programs that may run in the background, uh, such as Outlook or MS Teams and so on. Please feel free to ask uh, any questions that might come up during, uh, during the presentations. I would ask you to type them in the chat. We will only then go into the questions after the second uh, presentation so that we are sure um, that we can uh, that we have enough time um, also to show the second sh surgery okay um, um, so just a short introduction many of you um, know that medel is also offering now passive miller implants f uh, yeah since a year now you can see on the screen the, the portfolio that we have at the moment in the front with the four staples plus the implant and in the back with the uh, seven um, tympanoplasty implant uh, that we have in our portfolio at the moment. Today we will see the m clip arc, which you, you can see in the very right end of the back row, and the m, uh, m exact Pro, that is uh, the second from the left side. And we will start with uh, Professor Dirk Beutner. Thank you already for joining us. As I said before, he's the head of the ENT department at the University uh, Hospital in Göttingen. And he will uh, show us a surgery with the m clip arc. So as you see in this picture here, the m clip arc has um, a clip uh, coupling structure um, to place the prosthesis on the head of the stapes and a micro ball joint between the shaft and the head plate that makes the head plate really, really flexible. And I'm sure you're all very curious um, about the surgery and what uh, Professor uh, Beutner can tell us about it, especially because he was also involved in the development of the prosthesis. So really exciting. Professor Beutner, can you hear us? You're muted. I'm not long muted. Perfect. So thank you for joining. Um, and we're looking forward to your presentation. Thank you very much. I'm pleased to talk uh, on this occasion about the new uh, POP, partial ossicular replacement prosthesis, the M-clip arc. Um, this prosthesis was developed in conjunction with METAL. However, before we start with uh, surgical issues, I would like to draw your attention to um, a main issue in middle ear implantology, and I would like to have my slides popping up. Can you start my presentation? It's coming, yeah. One moment. Okay. okay. So the physiolo physiological function of the circular chain is uh, on the uh, one hand, the acoustic function, where the ossicular chain vibrates as a rigid body. And on the other hand, uh, due to gliding of the joints, the ossicular chain protects the sensible and, and uh, sensory neural structures in the middle, ear, in the inner ear uh, for large uh, atmospheric pressure. Um, 
displacements. Looking at present reconstruction techniques, modern rigid prosthesis can give adequate acoustic results. However, with the acoustic shortcut pr uh, produced by this implementation of this passive prosthesis, the malleo-incudial joint, the key in atmospheric pressure variation is bypassed. Moreover, um, the implanted rigid prosthesis is subject to intrinsic variation. Tilting of the prosthesis and dislocation is a major issue in poor post-operative hearing outcomes. Furthermore, pressure points in contact areas can eventually lead to migration of the implanted rigid prosthesis. And to overcome these um, problems, um, micromechanical solution was developed. That is the M-clip arc. And you can see that the ball joint between prosthesis shaft and prosthesis plate is implanted um, for adaptation to varying uh, placements of the tympanic membrane. However, before we uh, got into clinical application, we performed uh, temporal bone experiments. And here we used laser Doppler vibrometry um, to examine the acoustic transmission characteristics. Um, here, acoustic stimulation occurred with sinusoidal sounds in the external auditory canal, and the sound conduction through the middle ear can be picked up either on the stay piece or around window membrane. Here you see an example at 500 hertz. Um, so now you see the acoustic transmission characteristics um, showing the M-clip, the standard rigid prosthesis in blue, and the M-clip arc in red. And what you can see is the uh, displacement as a function of the stimulated, stimulated frequency. And what turns out in, in, in six temporal bone experiments that uh, there is no uh, statistic difference between these prostheses, indicating that the mobile uh, head plate doesn't impede any acoustic transmission, so that it transmits sounds to the point of energy as good as the standard clip prosthesis. Um, moreover, I would like to show a small movie that uh, was um, done by uh, Nick Bevis and Thomas Efforts from my lab, that you can see the advantages from the middle ear um, in this movie. movie. You can see this is a during Valsalvo's maneuver. Um, the forces that apply on the on the prosthesis, and you can see this joint is working, and is, the prosthesis is still in place. These promising uh, temporal bone results were taken as a basis for clinical applications, and I'm happy to present and show you the first implantation of the prosthesis at the University of Göttingen in the following movie. Um, and this, we, and before I, we go into the video, I would like to uh, present the case. This is a female patient, uh, 59 year old with a history of chronic otitis media, um, status post tympanoplasty um, multiple times on the right ear and her chief complaint was uh, hearing, hearing loss and discharge. By examination, it was obvious that they had the bulging of the anterior canal wall and a subtotal large defect of the tympanic membrane. Furthermore, she showed uh, mixed hearing loss up to 40 decibel airborne gap. What was the surgical plan? First of all, um, the indication of surgery is given not only by the defect, also by the um, hearing loss. And the surgical plan was first to do a canalplasty to uh, reduce this bulging of the anterior canal wall. This is, in my uh, hands, very mandatory to get a self-cleaning good, good ear and also for reconstruction of defects in the anterior parts of the membrane. And as it's uh, 
revision surgery and with a long history of uh, chronic otitis, we plan a cartilage tympanoplasty. However, um, in this case, um, there was a stapes only situation. So the M-clip arc is, uh, is going into place. So, and now we um, start with the video. Uh, so we use a retro auricular incision, the same incision as the previous surgeons use, um, using, and first of all, we go to the temporalis muscle and um, then we use a semicircular incision Uh, around the external ear canal and a small incision uh, on the mastoid bone. As the patient is on aspirin due to uh, coronary stents, uh, there's some more bleeding as, as regular. work done by Plestis Respiratorium and to lift up the skin from the canal. And now we go into the ear canal and use standard instruments. So this is a regular um, way to open up an ear. And after this, we go into uh, onto, onto the microscope. And the first step was to look at the bony ear canal and lifting up the tympanomyeatal flap. I usually start down here and uh, then going up. And as you can see, the bulging of the anterior canal wall uh, doesn't um, make it possible to, to see the, the defect in, in full extension. So this is the limbus, the annulus fibrosus showing here. And uh, this is middle ear mucosa already. And now we use uh, a sickle knife to open up the middle ear mucosa and open up the ear in the hypotympanic. Let's go to the ear canal, to the bony work. And here it's very important to do a shifted, anterior shifted incision, not to have overlaying scars that can um, lead to uh, circumferential stenosis. And now we perform a lateral flap of the ear canal. The round angled knife is in close contact with the bone. And the same applies for the deeper parts, another flap. And goal is to enlarge the external ear canal that you can overview the whole um, tympanic membrane. OK, 
can see it. you flap in the skin and then using verse varying sizes to enlarge the bony ear canal. So the burr gets smaller. And I would not use a cutting burrs for this because that can uh, damage your skin. And if, if it gets down to the tympanic membrane, um, one has to make sure not to touch the malleus or the skin and not to uh, damage the skin. And for this, one can also use a silicon sheet to protect the skin while enlarging the anterior canal. Mikey, from the top. Como? Uh, use a silicon sheet to protect the medial skin. And you, as you can see, the burrs get getting smaller the closer you get to the eardrum and to the, the smaller the bone to be removed. This work is uh, worth to be done. Otherwise, you, you experience problems during surgery in uh, really overviewing anterior defects, as well as for postoperative care. It's really important to, to overlook the whole tympanic membrane. OK. So now we deepitalizing the margins of the tympanic membrane, you see there is almost no epithelia. It's it's scar formation. And I use an angled knife. I not scissor out the defect to freshen up the, the um, uh, edges. Because then you can have the problem that you lose and leave, leave some uh, epithelia behind. Now we're going up to the ossicular chain. And uh, what turns out that you have only the stapes here visible. However, we have to also open up and uh, lifting up the annulus far more anteriorly to really get a good exposure about the defect. Here, this mucosa uh, is middle ear mucosa, and sometimes I use also a, a small scissor to to cut it. OK, so ex exposition, exposure of the defect is really important, especially in anterior defects and large defects. Furthermore, we're using a, a sickle knife uh, for, we call it, anterior trypanotomy to go uh, before anterior to the malleus to open up the middle ear in this area. This is especially important for the technique I use to fixate, um, fixate um, the transplant. So this was a corda tympani, shortly visible. And this is the anterior tympanotomy. Corda tympani is visible here. It's a business card of the surgeon. And in the oval niche, there's only the stapes visible. You see here the facial nerve. And the stapes is the lenticular process of the incus is still in place. And um, it's recommended to remove this piece of bone 
Otherwise, you have also a joint between your prosthesis and, and the clip. And it's really important to check the oval niche, what's going on here. And um, yeah, also remove some, some scars to get a good view on the oval niche and the stapes. OK. And what you can't see on the video clip is the uh, palpatory elements that the surgeon has to feel whether it's good. OK. As we, as we plan a uh, cartilage tympanoplasty, we uh, take some cartilage from the patient's ear. And as it's a retroauricular incision, it's uh, recommended to use uh, cartilage from the conchia or the tsumba in this case. And uh, I use my finger on the other hand of the incision to press against this area I want to excise. And I'm not only ex uh, excising cartilage, I'm, only, I'm also excising some periconium still in place on this uh, transplant. Then I use a Freer's respiratory to remove it, still with, with some counter pressure with my finger on the, on the other side, from the inner side. So this cartilage is a full thickness graft, and it needs to be cut it in at least half or more than half uh, with some pericondium in place. And this is done here. This is a comp composite graph of cartilage in periconium. You can see it. And it's really important that the cartilage rests on the bony rim of the um, ear canal. Otherwise, it falls into the cavity. And up here, we pull it through the periconium part, through the um, anterior tympanotomy and have it rest also here on the bony rim. So we don't use gel foam or other materials to stabilize this construct. If it's not stabilized on its own, it will never be stabilized. So up here, we put, pull it through. You see the transplant, you see the cartilage. This is cartilage and a small hook helps to pull this uh, transplant through. And it will rest on the bone up here. Yes. Pull it through and, and align it in the same, in the right order. So now you have this um, defect in underlay techniques that's very important. Do not overlay some uh, transplants. And then the cartilage needs to be rest on the bony rim. Okay. So, and for uh, covering the prosthesis plate, I use really thin cartilage. You see how thin it can get. And also put it under the other cartilage like it overlaying tulip blossom so that it stabilizes also the whole reconstruction. OK. And place it on the bony rim as, as this. OK. This is thin cartilage just for covering the prosthesis plate and stabilizing the tympanic membrane. OK. And now we get to the point where the prosthesis comes into place. First of all, we need to measure the length of the prosthesis. And Medel has got sizes. And um, this is a 1.5 millimeter sizer that functional length that fits very well. And I really recommend to have no tension on the prosthesis. And um, because otherwise you would preload the annual ligament and hearing, especially in lows, is very bad. Okay, now we 
get to the MCLIP arc prosthesis. It comes in uh, this uh, package. And first of all, you have to remove the covering of the prosthesis. Several ways are possible to uh, remove this shield. And then, first of all, I use a drop off saline to uh, remove the static forces that, that are on the, on the titanium. And for transportation and um, adjustment, alignment, and placement, I use a suction device, small suction device. And uh, as you can see, the, the joint is uh, working. And the joint has got also another positive side effect and a really positive uh, effect um, that you can flip away the plate during placement. That means that you not only have an open head plate for good vi visualization, that you can really uh, look on the clip, on the stapes, uh, how the placement is going on and how the coupling to the superstructure is. Okay. Okay, so it's, you see the, the, the prosthesis plate is flipped away and you can really good see what's going on on the, on the stapes. We need to focus the microscope a bit. And now you have the, on one hand the suction device, on the other hand the uh, needle, and you can see what you are doing, not only feeling or guessing, you can really see what's going on. And that is also a huge advantage of this mobile head plate. So first step is to clip it, to get it on the staple superstructure. And in the next step, you push it over the staple superstructure by gently pressure. And then you have a self-retaining prosthesis. And now you can align your prosthesis plate to the individual needs of the patient. And you can see the plate is never in 90 degree fashion to the tympanic membrane as the tympanic membrane is not a, a solid plate. And we now uh, get our cartilage on top and um, use some silicon sheets to uh, for better epithelialization of the transplant and the, and the tympanic membrane. And these silicon sheets, I prefer using at least three. And whenever I uh, do some work on the anterior wall, I also cover the anterior wall with a uh, silicon sheet. And then we use gel foam soaked in uh, tetracycline um, for preventing hematoma and, and uh, uh, right placement of the transplant. So. so this is for the epithelialization of the anterior canal wall where I used also an incision. And these sheets will be removed after three weeks post-op. And those sheets were secured by some, some gel foam and those gel foams also uh, help with that uh, hematoma, especially in these um, aspirin taken patients uh, will not lift up the skin from the from the bone. So 
So the rest is uh, standard closure in layers with standard vicryl sutures and this is done as you all would do it. And these stitches were, will be removed one week post-op. Having done this, I use uh, another ear package to open up the entrance of the ear canal. And uh, this is self-expanding and um, uh, furthermore, as we used cartilage here and to prevent hematoma from this uh, part, I also use some package in the uh, conchia area. So I thank you for watching and this video and I'm happy to answer your questions after Professor Nunsky's talk. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Beutner. Really, really interesting surgery. Um, and uh, also congrat congratulations uh, for doing the first MCLIP ARC and for developing such a great prosthesis. Um, now, uh, for time reasons, I would uh, go uh, immediately to Professor Nunsky. Um, just show you shortly um, what he will uh, be, be showing us. So uh, Professor Mlinski is the, in, uh, the head of the ENT department at the University Hospital in Rostock. Um, he uh, will use an MXACT Pro partial prosthesis. Um, this prosthesis was developed in collaboration with the LMU in Munich. Um, it is a length adjustable partial prosthesis and uh, can be, the length can be ad adapted inside this red box that you see in, on the screen at the moment. And Professor Mlinski will uh, show you how he, how he did it and how he does it. Professor Mlinski, can you hear us? Yes, I can. Perfect. Thank you. So please um, go, uh, go ahead with your presentation and the video. Thank you. All right, I will take over the uh, screen and share my presentation. Yes, thank you very much uh, for the introduction. And um, for those who are not familiar with Rostock, Rostock is in the sunny north of Germany. And Rostock has the third oldest university in Germany, only Heidelberg and Leipzig are older. Uh, but we are proud to have the oldest Otorhinolaryngology University Department in Central Europe. Uh, it was built in 1899 by the first university chair for otorhinolaryngology, Otto Kerner. Ot this is the department those days, and that's what it looks now. Otto Kerner is the uh, most otologist known by the Kerner septum and his works for the intracranial autogenic uh, complications. But we want to talk about uh, middle ear surgery and chronic ear disease. Just some basic um, effects to, or base, base, baselines uh, in our understanding to this disease and the therapeutic principles. Chronic middle ear disease requires surgery. There's no conservative treatment to heal this disease. And this surgery or this therapy has two goals. First is the removal of the disease. And second is the restoration, restoration or preservation of hearing for the patient. And this uh, preservation of hearing includes reconstructive measures, the closure of the eardrum, as we have just nicely seen by Professor Beutner, and uh, also the reconstruction of the ossicular chain. And in cholesteriatoma, maybe reconstruction of posterior canal wall or obliteration of cavities. However, the closure of the eardrum and the ossicular chain reconstruction are termed uh, tympanoplasty, as we all know. It is uh, introduced and has been uh, systematically described by Horst Ludwig Bullstein. And these are the original publications of uh, pictures from 1953 
um, where he introduced it on the World Congress in Amsterdam. From those, uh, mainly two parts are still used, the partial ossicular replacement and the total ossicular replacement um, named type three ossiculoplasty and uh, the processes being used nowadays are titanium processes. And we are going to show you now a very smart design uh, of a very uh, sophisticated development of these processes. And the principle is underlay technique from Plester and Kahn, as uh, Professor Beutner just explained. And we are performing uh, these surgery always without mastoidectomy. Why? If you, if you look at these very nice pictures um, from uh, Wolstein uh, in his publication on the tympanoplasty from 19. 86, you can see several mem membrane folds uh, between the incus and the uh, lateral and the medial wall of the tympanic cavity. And these can obstruct the windkessel function of the mastoid. So a mastoidectomy does not help uh, in a better aeration and air transduction between the tympanic cavity and the mastoid process. Again, or additionally, we destroy still functioning uh, unaffected mastoid cells and uh, the mucosal problems in the mastoid are the consequence, not the cause of the central perforation or adhesive processes. And the uh, better performance may be to open the attic passage by removing Malle's head and Inca's body. And from there, we can also do uh, rinsing, for example, of the mastoid. However, the case we are going to present you today is a 16 year old female um, with a recurrent effusions in the left ear. She had adenectomy, uh, adenectomy um, as a younger child and she remained from recurrent discharge. At the moment she has an adhesive process with um, not overseeable retraction pockets in the pars tensa, terming it a pars tensa cholesteatoma. Uh, with uh, spontaneous type 3. On the right side, you see the tympanogram uh, showing the very uh, floppy tympanic membrane. So if you would please uh, start the video now. Is it better now? Okay, now we, we see through the funnel the microscopic image and the spontaneous type three, the retraction pocket and the eroded uh, long process of the incus. It's a right ear, a retroauricular, um, sorry, <laughs> it's a left ear, the retroauricular approach as you've just seen before and incision of the neatal skin. Uh, using blade number 15 and uh, preparation with a plester's knife or straight rounded knife. Lifting of the meatal skin, removal of the attic wall and the posterior canal wall until we fully oversee the retraction pocket and the adhesive. This is the final preparation of this adhesion in the beneath the um, pyramidal eminence. You, you have a view on the stapes tendon, pyramidal eminence. On the right corner is the facial. There's a small facial nerve hernia. The facial is not fully covered. And the floppy part of the tympanic membrane is removed. Therefore, we lift back the meatal skin. And now this part of the tympanic membrane can be resected. The tympanic, uh, the outer ear canal has been also widened using diamond burrs, as you've seen in the procedure from 
Professor Beutner. This is very uh, important in order to have a good view during surgery and of course for the aftercare for the patient. Next will be the removal of the eroded incus. Therefore, we dissect the incostapedial joint with a 90 degree hook. It's important to identify the actually joint surface in order to remove also the lenticular process, which has in some cases still epithelium and will cause recurrent cholesteatoma. The tympanic membrane is also lifted until we identify the anterior ligament of the malleus and have a clear overview on the neck of the malleus. The cord tympani had been dissected earlier because it was involved in the adhesive process. And this step is important uh, in order to later secure the tympanic membrane. But now we dissect the malleus head with the malleus head nipper. And I would like to draw your attention now to a mucosal fold, which will, which will be between the tensor tympani tendon and the anterior malleal ligament. We will now dissect this with the antrum hook. It's now right on top of the hook. Now it has been opened and we can identify the antral hook anterior to the anterior and inferior to the tensor tympani tendon. Make sure not to dissect the tendon in these cases in order to stabilize the remnants of the malleus handle. Next step will be the harvesting of a tympanic membrane craft. In this case, we will use um, a composite craft perichondrium for a full support of the floppy tympanic membrane and we will need cartilage in order to protect the reconstructive uh, reconstructed tympanic membrane from the uh, head of the prosthesis for penetration. The procedure is quite similar as you've seen earlier. We use or expose in this case the Zimba cartilage and have our index finger in the Simba and turn the, uh, the auricle anteriorly so we have enough tension and then just incise the cartilage, to, uh, the perichondrium together with the cartilage. Now we will lift the cartilage using a Joseph's scissor So part of this uh, pay contribute is lifted with the scissor and then we use a wet swap in order to separate the, the perichondrium from the cartilage. This is very handy and speeds up the harvest of the perichondrium a lot. As Professor Beutner already explained earlier, the cartilage for covering the prosthesis head should be very slim and very thin. So you can use either a cartilage cutter instruments or we do a little carpaccio here with the with a fresh uh, number 10 knife. The perichondrium cleft gets a small incision, which will rest uh, superiorly anteriorly, and um, with the now and the top lying 
corner, we can we we will uh, pull through uh, the between the anterior malleal ligament and the malleus neck in order to support the anterior superior uh, lying to train membrane graft from falling towards the um, opening of the Eustachian tube. So again, underlay technique, and it is important to have the craft resting on the bone and uh, we use the natural adhesive forces of the craft towards the remnants of the tympanic membrane. We never put anything in the tympanic cavity because we want air and no gel foam, no foils, no anything inside. And if the reconstruction doesn't stay on its own, as Professor Boyden already said, then uh, the surgery was not, or it needs to be maybe repeated. Now we pull through the anterior part, the, the anterior tympanic membrane craft. So we see the neck, uh, once this little blood drop is removed, we look to the neck and here the lifted uh, membrane. And now we pull through the tympanic membrane craft. It is between the lateral uh, process of the malleus handle, the anterior malleal ligament, but under the tympanic membrane and the anterior annulus. So by this, we make sure that we have no epithelium migrating into the aticotomy and uh, we prevent recurrent cholesteatoma. The craft rests on the tympanic, uh, on the tympanic bone and uh, therefore uh, stabilizes the entire reconstruction. Next step will be the ossicular chain reconstruction. We will use a partial prosthesis resting on the stapes head and with the plate partially under the malleus handle. So this is the uh, kit provided um, by the manufacturer and we have the sizes and the prosthesis in one uh, box. The sizes are sorted and marked from small to large with these little um, markings in the box and not see, not, not uh, being demonstrated by the video, but on the uh, dummies are also, or on the sizes are also the numbers of the lengths, of the functional lengths of these prosthesis. It starts at one millimeter and ends uh, one, 1.5, 2, 2.5 at three millimeter functional lengths. So, because uh, there's not, a lot of space uh, between the malleus handle and the stapes here. We check with a one millimeter functional length um, dummy. Transfer is using uh, a black or 0.9 millimeter suction. So now we prepare the prosthesis. The advantage of this prosthesis, you need only one kind in stock and can adjust the prosthesis to your individual lengths. The functional length is between the head and the bottom of this little bell. So we have to pull up the prosthesis until the bottom of the bell is at one millimeter. And then we use a pointed VBO, right? Of course, we rotate the bell so it gets in line with the stapes tendon and the head of the prosthesis. And now we use this little pointed uh, titanium forceps and click together the corners of the head and 
it has a little uh, hook. Now we cut off the excess part of the wire from the top of the prosthesis. With a little needle, now we lift up the holding piece and the prosthesis and place it into the little well next to the next to the store. And also you see this little angulation. This is uh, in need because the level of the or the angle of the uh, tympanic membrane is not parallel to the angle of the staples head. Uh, we put also water in to, to reduce uh, electrostatic or aesthetics effect of the prosthesis and uh, placement is using a suction and placing it under the malleus handle and then on the stapes head. In order to prevent the head of the prosthesis from penetrating through the tympanic membrane reconstruction, we used the thinned out cartilage to cover uh, the prosthesis. So part of the prosthesis rests, uh, part of the head rests under the malleus head. So we have malleus, tympanic membrane, malleus head, then perichondrium, then the anterior superior part of the prosthesis head, then the cartilage and turn back of the medial skin uh, and cover it with elastic foils. And plugging of the ear canal with doxycycline soaked gelatine. Closure of the uh, outer ear layer by layer as you've seen earlier. All right, I think uh, we are a little uh, short of time, so we can uh, stop here. I thank you very much for your attention. If you like to come and visit uh, to Rostov, you're welcome. Next year, 7th to 9th March, we have a workshop on microsurgery of the middle ear and hearing implants. And uh, we would like, to be, uh, more than, you're more than welcome by me and our team or our team and me. Thank you very much. Great, thank you very much, Professor Mulinski, for this also very interesting surgery. Um, I know that um, we are um, now just in time, but I'm sure that, our, that there are some questions from the audience. So if you have time and are still interested in, in a discussion or even have questions yourself, please feel free to stay with us and uh, to unmute yourself. If you have a question, of course, you can also speak directly to our surgeons. Um, don't be shy. <laughs> so, uh, because if you are, I can, I have loads of questions, <laughs> actually. <laughs> so, um, maybe we start with uh, Professor uh, Beutner. Um, the, the, the head plate of the prosthesis is kind of loose, as we <coughs> saw in the video. Um, does that affect the, the sound transmission from your experience? Um, no, we have tested this also. Um... In, 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 in the lab and during development, we have to make sure that sound conduction is unaffected mm -hmm. and the uh, forces that are needed to, to move the head plate are in a physiological range and both is given by these. Mm -hmm. Okay, good. Thank you. Um, uh, Professor Mlinski, maybe you can Tell us a little bit about the, the, the role of the malleus in the ossicular chain reconstruction. This is always um, a, a debate, I think, <laughs> under, under uh, experts. So maybe you can tell us a little bit about your uh, stand uh, viewpoint. So. <laughs> yeah, it depends, of course, on the disease. And uh, the malleus handle usually has a very important function because from there, 
the um, collagen fibers radiate to the um, annulus of the tympanic membrane and it mm -hmm. uh, generates the tension of the tympanic membrane. Mm -hmm. So that's why we, of course, always try to protect and keep it. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, um, if we have cholesteatoma surgery um, or if we have re uh, recurrent disease, and uh, then uh, it's sometimes no problem in removing it. If you do mm -hmm. full reconstruction of the tympanic membrane, it might be more stable and uh, has better audiological results than in uh, trying to preserve the malleus handle. Mm -hmm. The uh, most severe problem, in, especially in uh, surgery like you've seen now, is if you have epithelium anterior the neck of the malleus, mm -hmm. and then you get a recurrence of the disease or cholest recurrent cholesteatoma just there. Okay, so better safe than sorry, I would say. <laughs> um, we actually have a question from uh, Dirk Hardik. Did you make any intraoperative testing? So I think this goes to both of you. Maybe Professor Boyton, if you could start. Um, no, the answer is, is no. We, we don't do any um, intraoperative testing on a routine basis. However, there are attempts to to place um, to place a uh, um, microphone in the external ear canal and, and measure uh, with a laser uh, what what you uh, how the placement of the prosthesis is. Um, however, this is not a routine procedure, I would say all over the world. So there are some experimental data and clinical studies on this, but no routine basis. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Is it the same for you, Professor Malinsky? Yes. In, in passive implants and tuberoplasty, we don't do any uh, intraoperative testing. Mm -hmm. In staple surgery, we do, but it's subjective. We do it in local anesthesia, and in the end of the surgery, we can ask the patient, uh, do you hear better? Mm -hmm. And we can do a little uh, flüster test, um, mm -hmm. so low noise test, and then, but no objective measurements. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Um, so we do have a, a question from Colombia. So hello to Colombia, first of all. Um, thank you. Um, and have you used endoscopes to perform, perform these procedures or only microscope? Um, as during the uh, video I've, I've shown, I used a microscope only. Mm -hmm. The endoscope is a valuable tool uh, in ear surgery not only in, in recent years, it's, uh, however, um, what you have seen is microscopic only. Mm. So do you see a, an advantage um, with the M-clip arc, um, with the endoscope, because you can see more um, if there's still re remnants of a cholesteatoma, for example, because of the head plate that can be tilted, is that? Well, we, so we are, we, we need to be, we need to be more um, experienced uh, using this. However, the M-clip arc will not help to get uh, better um, results in, in cholesteatoma or in, in chronic ear disease. It can help to reduce um, tilting or protrusion of prosthesis, but it will not help in healing chronic ear disease or in recidivism of cholesteatoma. Mm -hmm. Okay. Perfect, thank you. So um, let me check if there's another question. Um, maybe a little bit, okay. Um, okay, um, what about the audiological outcome of uh, the M-clip prosthesis? Is it better than conventional or PORPS? Greetings from Kiel. <laughs> so audiological outcome is influenced by, by many factors and, and um, the most important factor is the aeration of the ear. If you have air behind the membrane, you can really put um, varying designs of prosthesis into the middle ear. The clip design helps the surgeon for standardized coupling, self-retaining coupling, mm -hmm. but um, you cannot only use airborne gaps to, to judge a prosthesis. Mm -hmm. Perfect, thank you. Uh, maybe Professor Mlinski, do you also want to comment on that, even though we didn't use the M-clip arc yet? <laughs> uh, 
yes, this, there's not, not much else to say. Um, mm. Different, the, the influences on the outcome is so much. And when it comes to procedures, it needs to be handleable by the surgeon, mm -hmm. uh, convenient. And so there are as many procedures as there are otologic surgeons almost. And so titanium um, and um, individual design or individual measurements, individual adoption of the procedure type to the individual patient and its disease. Mm -hmm. so, uh, this is, I think, the way to the success. Okay, thank you. Um, okay, let me see if there's more questions in the chat. No, not as far as I see. Then maybe I can ask one more because I'm really curious. Um, so, uh, Professor Molinsky, uh, you mentioned that in the video you you turned the the shaft and and with that also the bell, um, and like that you adapted to the to the position of the of the uh, yeah of the anatomy of the patient basically of the head of the stapes. Maybe can you tell us a little bit more about that and why you think this could be useful? There's two things we need to uh, have a look at when we adjust the procedures. That's once the length of the procedures. Mm -hmm. So this should be, I recommend always in every surgery measured by the sizers and the dummies. And then is the orientation of the bell. Mm -hmm. so the bell has two cuttings and these one, either of the one cuttings should be in the same line as the long axis of the ellipsoid from the plate. Mm -hmm. And this ellipsoid plate in our experience is best pointing towards the anterior superior part of the reconstruction, mainly the um, entrance of the Eustachian tube from the middle ear. By this, it helps to support the anterior superior part of the tympanic membrane reconstruction because it is important that the anterior superior part of the tympanic me membrane reconstruction does not obstruct the Ostein tube orifice and the superior passage from the middle ear towards the mustoid cavity. Mm -hmm. the okay, perfect, thank you. Um, so I think now we could close the meeting, except if somebody really has no, another question, then please feel free to unmute yourself and um, ask uh, Professor Molinsky and Professor Beutner directly. Maybe we'll wait for three more seconds. In the meantime, I uh, would like to thank every one of you um, for joining us and for staying with us, um, even though we, we yeah, overstayed our time, so to say. Um, thank you also, a big thank you to Professor Mlinski and Professor Beutner for, for sharing their experience and their knowledge with us. Um, the next surgery online will be in four weeks, so on November 24th, and the, the surgeon and the, the surgery, actually, the topic will be announced very soon. So stay tuned and thank you and goodbye. Bye-bye.